they have upgraded from SQL 2000. Like I said, extended support and soon. It's going to cost you big money to call the customer service support hotline over Microsoft, get them to take your call, and get them to help you. And if you've got a SQL 2000 instance that's critical, you're probably not going to want to wait for this, or you're going to have to pay through the nose for it. Either way, it's not a good position that you're going to want to be in. Hey, Bradley, can I interrupt? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Just having a little um, audio issues. A couple people in the audience are saying that it's a little choppy. Let's do a different microphone real quick. Is this any better? That's much better. Thanks. Okay. All right. So, I, sorry about that, everybody. So, uh, talking about why to upgrade from SQL 2000, I'd say take a look at the new features. These were just the things I could think of off the top of my head, and I actually waited to fill this page out until this morning. Um, when you look at high availability, you've got mirroring, which was introduced in 2005. You've got always on, which was introduced in SQL 2012. You've got to upgrade from 2000 to uh, another version before you can go to 2012. There's not a direct step from SQL 2000 to 2012. Automatic page repair is a feature in mirroring that was introduced in SQL 2008, where if you have a data page that is corrupt and you're in high availability mirroring, it can actually repair that page. There are other features, performance data warehouse, policy-based management, compression, transparent data encryption, change data capture, backup compression, the dedicated administrator connection that allows you to connect starting in SQL 2005, which is a great way to be able to access your server if you're ever in a denial of service attack resource governor. It just goes on and on. When you look at the internal changes, once again, these are just the things I could think of this morning because I didn't want to try and overbloat it with everything because there's certainly a lot that has changed from version to version. You've got internal changes. The query memory grant in SQL 2005, which helps uh, out of memory exceptions not to occur quite so often. Check DBCC. Paul Randall completely rewrote that with his team over at Microsoft for SQL 2005. The null bitmap in, uh, in data records. That was also something that was introduced in 2005. The log compression ratio uh, for log shipping introduced in SQL 2008, which also makes mirroring more efficient, and it also makes log shipping more efficient. The lock and hash key, uh, key algorithm. It's a bit of a, a tongue twister, but it was introduced in SQL 2008 or 2. If you get false deadlocks, and what that means is whenever you insert a row, update a row, SQL Server performs a hash operation on that row. The algorithm that it used from SQL 7.0, it used all the way up until SQL 2008. In SQL 2008 R2, they introduced a new lock hash key algorithm. And what that did was it made it 100 million times less likely that you would get a collision on different rows. If you had rows that were very, very similar being inserted into the same table, it is possible that they would lock against one another and they would actually cause a false deadlock. That was alleviated in 2008 R2. That's also there in 2012. But any version prior to 2008 R2, it's not there. Memory usage was updated in 2012. If you've managed SQL Server over the years, when you go into SQL Server, you go into Properties, you take a look at the memory settings, you always want to make sure that you set the memory settings to a level lower than what the memory is for your operating system, so you can leave some memory there for your OS. Uh, in SQL 2012, they redid the way memory usage is. It used to be internal processes could actually grab that memory anyways. Uh, in SQL 2012, they actually reined it in so that it's less likely to actually exceed the cap that you put on it. So when you look at going from SQL 2000, don't, it's not broke, don't fix it. Actually, it doesn't really cut the mustard when you start looking at all the additional things that you could possibly add to be able to enhance your business either from a high availability standpoint or performance standpoint or from you as a DBA from a monitoring standpoint. So extended support dates. I wanted to throw this out there because the second Microsoft releases a product, they automatically put out when the extended support date and the support dates end. I've got a link at the end of the slide deck. The slide deck and the demos are actually already up on my blog, sqlballs.com, on the resources page. So feel free to go out there and get that if you want to follow along or if you uh, want to take a look at them while you're sitting here listening to me. Uh, but there's a link at the end of the deck that takes you to the web page for the extended support date specifically for SQL. Um, extended support for SQL 2000 ends April 9th, 2013. 
So on April 9th, you've got extended support. On April 10th, you no longer have it. Extended support for 2005, if you go from 2000 to 2005, that's where the majority of the internal changes were made. Uh, jumping from 2000 to 2005 was a very difficult process. People shied away because it was so difficult. Uh, those internal changes in 2005 are there in 2008, 2008 R2, and a lot of them are in 2012. So once you upgrade to even 2005, you've got a clear path of upgrade to 2012. 2005, though, ends in 2016. So if you upgrade to 2005, you're only buying yourself three years before you're going to have to do this entire process again. Uh, SQL 2008 and 2008 R2 have the same extended support date where they end, 2019 of July 9th. So if you're looking at going to SQL 2008 or 2008 R2, they're going to cost you the exact same amount. I would recommend going with 2008 R2 just because you've got some more internal changes and you've got some more features that are there. And, and for the same price, why not get a little bit more? And if you're looking to go to SQL 2012, its extended support date ends in SQL 20, uh, 2022. So I've decided to upgrade. Now what? Well, this is the bit of the agenda that we get to. We're going to talk about the upgrade advisor, compatibility level, what you need to transfer, DTS exchange, compatibility mode, and then the big one, logins and how to transfer them. So upgrade types. We've got two different upgrade types. When you upgrade SQL Server, you can either do an in-place upgrade, which means take uh, and insert the software media on your server, um, or attach it in an ISO, whatever you want to do, and upgrade the current instance as it stands. The pros to this is there's no cost related to standing up a new server. There's no busy migration making sure that you've got every last detail of the server migrated to a new one. The con is, if things go south, you're looking at a complete reinstall of SQL 2000 and all of the service packs associated with it, any hot fixes associated with it. As well, you're going to have to reset up and reconfigure that SQL 2000 instance. I typically would not recommend an in-place upgrade just because they are the most difficult, difficult to roll back from. One of the things you'll want to think about is your service level agreements that you have for your particular client applications. If it's, a, if it's an application that has to be up and running that is critical to your business, this is probably not the route that you want to take. You would probably want to use our second choice, move to a new server, a new SQL instance, or a new virtual instance. You could stand up a virtual server, you could put SQL Server on there, and you could transfer your logins over. You could stand up a new instance, perhaps on the same server or you might buy new hardware. Whatever you do, you're basically going to be going through the same steps. You're 